Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question asks if I can analyze the mental health and personality factors that may be at work in the case of Andreas Lubitz. Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I'll put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. So first I'll take a look at the background of Lubitz. I'll move to the timeline of the crime and then get to the mental health and personality factors. Andreas Lubitz was born on December 18, 1987. It's reported that he grew up in Bavaria. His father worked in banking and his mother played the organ in a church. At age 14, he joined a glider club, which connects to his later interest of becoming a commercial airline pilot. He graduated high school in 2007. Lufthansa Airline hired him in September of 2008. When he was in training to be a pilot, he was suspended because he experienced a depressive episode and was hospitalized. He returned to the training program in August of 2009. The mental health professional who treated him said that the depressive episode had fully resolved. He worked as a flight attendant for about a year and a half while still in the training program to get his commercial pilot's license. In December of 2013, he joined the airline German Wings, which was wholly owned by Lufthansa, and he was made a first officer in June of 2014. Now moving to the timeline of the crime, German Wings Flight 9525 departed Barcelona on March 24, 2015 at 9 a.m. So the times I'm using here are from the final report, so they may be different than other times that used a different time zone. The flight was scheduled to arrive at Dusseldorf Airport. The aircraft was an Airbus A320-211, which made its first flight in 1990. There were 144 passengers and six crew members aboard the aircraft. The captain was 34-year-old Patrick Seidenheimer, and 27-year-old Andreas Lubitz was the co-pilot. Lubitz and Seidenheimer were communicating normally during the first part of the flight, but then Lubitz became curt after the captain started the mid-flight briefing on the planned landing. At 9.30 a.m., the captain left the cockpit and the door locked behind him, which of course was normal. The captain attempted to re-enter the cockpit four minutes later by entering what is referred to as the normal access code. So this activates a buzzer inside the cockpit. Now this code is different than the code that he had that would unlock the door from the outside. So there's a normal access code and then one that unlocks the door. Now the buzzer that sounds alerts somebody inside the cockpit that someone wants to gain access. They can look at a camera and decide if they want to let that person in. Now we see that the captain also used the intercom and banged on the door. He didn't get a response to any of the verbal indications that he wanted to get in the cockpit. It is believed the captain then entered that code that would unlock the door, but Lubitz engaged an override from inside the cockpit that kept the door locked. This is available in case a crew member is taken hostage and forced to enter the code. The captain requested that the crew bring him a crash axe, which he used to try to open the door, but he was not successful. While all this was going on, Lubitz set the autopilot to 100 feet, so the aircraft would descend from 38,000 feet to 100 feet. After making the inputs, he increased the rate of descent several times. French air traffic control tried to establish contact with the flight, but there was no answer. The aircraft was traveling at about 435 miles per hour when it crashed into a mountain northwest of Nice, France at 9.41 a.m. There were no survivors. Now moving to the mental health and personality factors. The authorities searched the apartment of Lubitz. They found that he had searched the internet for ways to commit suicide and cockpit doors and their security provisions. They found notes written by a physician that excused Lubitz from work. The notes actually declared him unfit to work. One of these notes was ripped up. He hid this information from his employer. They found that in February of 2015, Lubitz was diagnosed with an anxiety disorder and a psychosomatic disorder by a private physician. On March 10, 2015, just two weeks before the crash, that same physician diagnosed Lubitz with possible psychosis 
and recommended that he be hospitalized. In that same time period, Lubitz was prescribed medication to help him sleep and antidepressants by a psychiatrist. Neither the physician nor the psychiatrist notified any authority regarding Lubitz's condition. Now the question here becomes, were they allowed to? And I'll talk about this a little later in the video. Lubitz suffered from chronic insomnia and believed he was going blind. He had consulted over 40 physicians. They were unable to find a physical cause for his complaints about his vision. He was concerned that the blindness would mean he would lose his pilot's license. So the theory here is that this motivated him to want to bring an end to his life. He had explored several ways to do this, but eventually decided on crashing an aircraft. It was reported that he recently broke up with a girlfriend, which likely only made his mood worse. His actions were quite surprising to many people who knew him. He was described as quiet, fun, happy, and enthusiastic. There's the sense that nobody really saw this coming. Even those that knew about the depression would never have predicted this. Of course, it's impossible to know his state of mind, but I think the psychosis in combination with the depression better accounts for what happened here than depression alone. The term psychotic depression means a break from reality that occurs sometimes when a person gets extremely depressed. It involves delusions and or hallucinations. So delusions are fixed false beliefs and hallucinations are sensory disturbances where people can see things that aren't there or hear things that aren't there. There are other types of hallucinations as well. Most depressive episodes do not involve psychosis. When looking specifically at delusions, often they are paranoid or persecutory, like somebody believes they're being chased by the government, but they can also take on many other forms, including religious, erotomanic, or somatic. In this case, it appears as though he was having somatic delusions as a result of being severely depressed. This explains why he had concerns about his vision that could not be explained by any physical cause. With this in mind, it seems like the psychosis supplied the irrational fear, and the depression made it so that he viewed his life as not worth living. Even still, psychosis and depression do not really explain the murders. If he had a break from reality and he was depressed, that may explain why he wanted to end his own life. But why did he kill innocent people? This part really doesn't seem to be consistent with psychosis or depression. One would think that if he was psychotic enough to do that, it would have been obvious to the pilot or anyone else who interacted with him on that day. Other than being curt in his discussion with the captain, there was no indicator he was about to commit murders. I think the bottom line here is that Lubitz was a killer. The psychosis and depression may have facilitated his actions, but they do not fully explain them. There are many ways he could have ended his life that didn't involve killing anyone else. Many people are depressed and many have psychosis for a variety of reasons, some unrelated to depression. Very few of these people engage in violence. It is still possible, though, that the depression caused the crime. As I talked about in the video about MH370, another flight that ended in disaster, there could be situations where somebody is so depressed that they are indifferent. They don't care if other people live or die. Or situations where they are so depressed that they want to make other people pay. It could be about revenge on a society that is viewed as uncaring or unhelpful. This crime highlighted some flaws in commercial aviation safety. Many carriers now require that two people are on the flight deck at all times, one of them capable of flying the plane. There have also been other ideas that have come out, like this idea that the airline could take control of the plane remotely. This technology is actually available, but there are concerns that this system could be hacked. There has also been a lot of discussion about how pilots are assessed for mental health problems. There is no easy answer to this dilemma. Pilots are usually assessed every year below the age of 40 and every six months above the age of 40. Now this is primarily a medical assessment, but it includes a mental health component. There is no reason to believe that mental health risk would change from below 40 to above 40, but clearly medical risk increases above 40. Rather than assessing mental health at these intervals, I think it makes more sense to have regular interaction with mental health professionals. A clinician can assess a lot more accurately when they know somebody's baseline. It's difficult to get an idea 
of someone's baseline if that clinician is only seeing the pilot for an hour or so every six months or every year. I also think that the pilots should not be punished for reporting mental health symptoms, which is really what happens now. The process should really be focused on restoring them to a point where they can safely operate the aircraft. The last question I want to talk about here is one that I mentioned briefly before regarding the obligation of a mental health professional to report a pilot's symptoms to the authorities. Now, these rules differ a bit from country to country. In many countries, including the United States, pilots have to disclose any mental health problems. The difficulty, of course, is that pilots can lie, and the mental health professionals aren't necessarily going to reliably report information to the FAA. The question becomes, are they allowed to? What if a clinician was treating a pilot and that clinician became worried about a condition that would disqualify the pilot from flying? For example, according to the FAA, psychosis, bipolar disorder, and severe personality disorders are automatic disqualifiers from operating an aircraft. Could that mental health professional contact the airline, the FAA, or for that matter, law enforcement? So I'll answer this question from the point of view of what happens in the United States. This falls under what's called a duty to protect, which is actually different from state to state, which makes it kind of confusing. Generally, in order for a clinician to breach confidentiality, there has to be a specific threat. Like if a client was in a therapy session and they said when the session was over, they were going to go home and kill their roommate. The clinician would be obligated to protect that roommate, and this obligation could be satisfied by simply calling the police. It gets a little murkier when someone has symptoms that could cause harm to other people, but there is no specific threat. Even still, clinicians can intervene when there is a risk to the public. It's a good idea for a clinician in a situation to seek supervision and to clearly document their ethical decision-making process which led to the breach of confidentiality. Most of the time, a client will consent to have information shared if the clinician properly explains why that's a good idea, why it's clinically important or important for protecting the safety of the public. It's rare that a clinician would have to actually make the decision to unilaterally release confidential information. So to sum things up, this is a tragic case that once again highlights the difficult balance between the rights of the individual and the safety of the public. Those are my thoughts on the Andreas Lubitz case. Please put any opinions or thoughts in the comments section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be interesting. Thanks for watching.